if you don't want your uh, image to appear, you can turn off your video uh, because otherwise you'll be a little tiny box at the top of the screen. All right, Casey, all, your, all you. Perfect. So hello, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for coming. Thank you for the introductions. Great to learn about what all of you are doing. Um, I was so excited when I got the uh, request to speak with you today. And I think it was some time ago. So excited, in fact, I think within a week, I had already written everything I wanted to say to you all. So um, I've been fine tuning it since then. Maybe it's the beginnings of a novel, we'll see, but I will try to keep it, you know, contained and brief. Um, but I realized a lot just in, in putting it all on paper. There have been a lot of um, moments in my career that in hindsight were absolutely uh, pivotal and uh, I learned a ton from and I'm hoping that some of what I'm going to share with you today uh, will be at least um, interesting, uh, maybe insightful, and um, at best helpful to you as you continue to navigate your careers. Um, so thank you so much for having me. I'm quite honored to be here. I think Beth did a great job giving you kind of the nuts and bolts of my background. Um, the only thing I would add is that um, I actually did not study business in college. I was a um, cognitive anthropology major, even uh, did some graduate study in cognitive anthropology. And I had dreams of advancing our understanding of the human condition across all time and all space on earth. That's what anthropologists do. Um, but I ended up taking on a marketing role in a startup company somewhere between my first and second year of graduate school. And uh, I really liked it. I was surprised how much I liked it. And um, doing market research was very aligned with the cognitive anthropology research that I had been doing. Um, so I went from um, kind of uh, anticipating a lifetime of academia to a business career that accelerated very quickly. So starting in 2002, I worked in an innovation lab uh, for an insurance company. Um, I was in that lab for two and a half years, and I have three patents in my name for inventions that were developed um, during that time. And I think we can go to the next slide, maybe. And I will say the slides aren't um, much more than props, so we can go back to video if, um, if that's useful. I'm seeing the, the Nobo video right now. So if folks would rather kind of see me talk, um, my slides aren't, aren't um, aren't too useful. Uh, they're just like props. Um, so once I had worked in that innovation lab, I was sort of handpicked to work in a corporate strategy unit. And uh, here I was exposed to the entire insurance value chain. So now I'm four or five years out of college and I'm working for a team that reports to the president of the company um, and his leadership team. And I was there for six years. So most of the initiatives I worked on were very high profile. Um, my team and I were given latitude to break all the rules and even some China, if that's what it took to get things done. Um, in a way, he was trying to teach the company at that time a new and more assertive and purposeful way of working. Uh, it turns out that was a really natural fit for me and served as a foundation for my, continuance, my continued high performance. Um, so I was first promoted to vice president when I was 33 years old. And then a year later, I joined a new company as a senior vice president. Um, I would note that today I'm sitting here almost 43 and I'm still a senior vice president. My responsibilities have ebbed and flowed throughout my career, um, sometimes reflecting you know, personal um, issues in my life, um, but I continue on my journey and most important to me, more so than whatever title I have, um, how long I have it, is that I'm doing good work, that I'm recognized uh, for the good work that I do, that I'm paid for it, of course, um, and that I am learning and I am becoming better as I go. And for me, a lot of that learning comes from um, the people I, I work with um, and, and learning from their styles, um, how they engage with customers, with partners and with each other. So I guess the last point would be just about um, my personal life, because um, I get this question. I am divorced. I have three children. They're 15, 13, and six. Uh, just this weekend, I had to set up a, a little um, first grade-like space for my six-year-old um, as we are in remote learning here in New Jersey. 
and I need to maintain a full-time job sitting here in my home office while he is um, logging into Zoom uh, classes all day long. So I'm hopeful that I created a space that will at least um, make him feel like he's going somewhere every day and that is where schoolwork is to get done. Um, Okay, so overall, in all of my experience, I have always felt that, um, you know, women and just don't have the same luxuries that men do to nurture a family, if, if that is part of um, your life, um, and to really do your best job. And I'll just give you um, an example. When I had my third uh, child, I was five weeks postpartum, and my boss at the time asked me to go on a business trip. I was in Santiago, he wanted me to go to Colombia, and uh, I didn't think it was really necessary and I pushed back. Um, but at the end of the day, I went and it was the wrong decision for me. I was not ready. I did not wanna leave my child behind. Um, and eventually I left that company and that was like part of my rationale for that. So sometimes um, the lack of sensitivity that men can have for uh, what it means to be a new mother or a mother at all, um, you know, can lead to career changes, at least in my experience. Um, so often I felt like I had to earn my position even after I'd been in the job for a very long time. Um, and really, you know, coming to grips with how to manage my personal life and the time I could spend with my children and my career uh, was a constant struggle. Um, now that I'm uh, divorced and I have kind of a handle on how to be a single mom after a couple of years. And I also have a handle on the future of my career, meaning once I stop trying to navigate my career and just let happen what will happen, um, living into all of my principles every day, uh, it became that much uh, easier to have both the, you know, during work and out of work time that I needed. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of critical lessons, the first of which is authenticity. Um, and I just wanna point out here that uh, I, up until I was asked to do this, I had never read uh, Sheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. And I know that book is incredibly uh, popular and you know people love it, I did love it. Um, I ended up reading it right before, or right after I first wrote this, um, just cause I wanted to understand, you know, are my experiences, distinct, right? Does anything that she talked about in that book, can I relate to any of it? And I did relate to a lot of it. And the reason I bring that up is to say, one, I didn't plagiarize it if you recognize anything. And two, um, I think she, she woke, awoke in me um, as I was reading it, so many experiences and moments that I had in my career that um, I just hadn't really understood or um, fully analyzed or embraced or seen their impact on me. So what is authenticity? Um, it's embracing who we are and living who we are. In business, my belief is that anything that you pretend to be will eventually be seen by others and will cause conflict within yourself. And that conflict within yourself will impact your performance definitively. I think there's a misconception that women have to sometimes walk into the room like guns blazing, here I am, you know, try to be like the men and you have to be who you are, whatever that is. And that's something that it took me a long time to figure out how to be my true self, um, but it worked out um, in my favor. So I'll, I'll give an example of that. So I've always been very organized. I have a memory for minute details. I am both a process and a systems thinker. I'm also a strategist and a pragmatist. I can define a strategy that'll take us three years into the future, and I can practically figure out with all the current and future constraints, conflicting priorities, how to actually achieve that outcome. Um, so I'm both the visionary and uh, the planner and the doer. Um, I could be charismatic when my feet are fully underneath me. That's a lot of stuff, right? Um, and when I was young and female, and I was all of that, um, you know, tackling some gnarly problems, a lot of things happened that I wasn't expecting. It was threatening. So my work was stolen or misrepresented. It was watered down uh, by the bosses. I got feedback that told me to dumb it down, stop being so serious, not to sweat the small stuff. And all the while, 
I thought I was just focused on the desired outcomes. I was being detail oriented because that's what was required to get the job done. Um, that suffering wasn't fun, right? So what was inside of me, who and how I wanted to be, and what was accepted in the workplace, there was a disconnect. And it caused all these doubts about my abilities, um, wanting to be, uh, my ability to be successful. Um, there ended up being a lot of scrutiny on my micro performance because my macro performance was rock solid and seemed to be effortless. So people didn't really understand how could I not having been in the industry for 15 years, come up with answers that others had struggled with for so long. How could I make connections between things so quickly? I wasn't tenured enough to do that. I didn't go to business school, let alone a name brand business school. So there's a lot of scrutiny around like the small things that I did. So one time I'm in a meeting and uh, at the end of it, my boss pulls me aside and says, uh, I noticed that you were tapping your um, I noticed that you were impatient in the meeting. And I said, gee, um, I'm sorry. I apologized, of course. Um, could you tell me what I did specifically and how I can do better next time? And his answer was, I noticed you were tapping your pen on the table and your face looked uncomfortable. And so I didn't really know like, how to be polite about this, but I said, well, I don't know if you noticed, but I am seven months pregnant and I really had to pee. And you told us, not to leave the room and we were working through lunch and so he blushed and his you know he was embarrassed as you can imagine and but the fact of the matter was like i was afraid of him i was afraid of the people who were more senior than me i ignored my biology right it's a problem that he can't identify with that he would never think of you know all that pressure on your bladder at that moment in time for that long um and so you find yourself um, having to kind of point these things out um, but, you know, things like that eroded my confidence. Meanwhile, I'm getting lots of accolades um, and, you know, all the public acclaim is sort of the opposite of how people are responding to me uh, day to day. Um, during that same pregnancy, my colleagues, all of whom were men, uh, created a pool to see how much weight I would gain in my second pregnancy. So some would walk by and they would, um, you know, offer me a chocolate bar. Others would walk by and say, shouldn't you be eating salad for lunch? Uh, and this was sport. So I told myself at the time, well, men are competitive and this is how they bond. This is their way of making me one of the guys. And I didn't recognize that being one of the guys, uh, yeah, not, not really what was uh, going to help me. So we suffer in silence. Um, so maybe some of you have had similar types of issues. I can see some of the comments um, popping up. Um, but eventually, as I proved myself again and again, and as I started to work on my personal development, Elizabeth, which was essential, um, at one point in my career, I had a massive responsibility. Um, I was so far out over my skis and everybody knew it, but enough senior executives believed in me that they gave me the biggest stretch assignment of my entire career. And in the process, they gave me an executive coach and they had me working with her for a year, um, which was the hardest work I've ever done um, up to then on myself. Um, but ultimately it gave me the confidence to um, lead in a way that was resonant, to listen, to hear, to recognize, and to show up in a way every day that was more for the people than it was for myself in fighting for the recognition or the equality that I was um, so seeking. Um, so 20 years ago, I started as that with all those characteristics. I still have them today, but now I know how to be as assertive as a situation requires. I'm no longer mostly intimidated by the men in the room just because they're men. Um, and no matter what it takes, um, I refuse to compromise my authentic self. I make choices about projects and people and relationships in a way that doesn't devalue what I know I bring to the table, what I know um, helps the corporation succeed in its objectives. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is courage. And, you know, why should women have to be courageous? I mean, I, and I mean like real courage. Um, you know, when I'm in a very senior meeting, uh, and this is true of all places I've worked, um, particularly in the insurance industry. 
uh, I always count the number of men, not like when I walk in, but once the meeting kind of gets going and it goes down a certain path and, and I don't feel that there's real uh, diversity or balance in the approach or the conversation. So I look around and there will be 13, 19, even five men and maybe one or two, uh, maybe three women. Um, and obviously when there's one, it's just me. Um, and these are all meetings with the leaders of the business. So if we invited human resources and operations and audit, there would be more women. But when it is just uh, the business heads, the division heads, um, there are very few women leaders there. Um, and whether it's internal or external partners, you know, I really, I really try not to see gender, but these are the things that happen and they still happen today, 20 years in, and these things are still happening to me. Someone in the room drops an F-bomb and then looks at me and apologizes. And I've never understood that. And so I usually will just chuckle and say, um, it's okay, my husband was a sailor in the Navy and I definitely heard that word before, so I'm good. Um, or some still uh, ask me to take all the notes even if there's more junior people in the room, if I'm the only woman, I must be the note taker. Um, I've had partners refuse to shake my hand, just look at me and shake all the hands of the men. And I think they think I'm like the admin or the coordinator or like I'm bringing lunch in. I'm not really sure what it is. Um, but those moments are very difficult. And um, it has taken me a lot of courage to kind of face all of that and not let it drag me down or have me underperform in a meeting. So I'm sitting in that meeting setting, it's gonna be my time to contribute. And if I've you know, been tabulating all of these things that are just absolutely awry, I'm, I'm not gonna do as well as I need to. So I've had to figure out how to put it aside and process it later um, and, and get through it. Um, like I literally have to count to 10 or I do that breathing exercise, four in, pause for four, four out, pause for four, right? Just to ground myself uh, back. Um, so, so then it comes my time and I do my authentic thing and I satisfy um, them that uh, I have a brain, I can speak, possibly even eloquently, I'm solid in my facts, I'm prepared for their questions and maybe I have a credible new idea or two. And when I do, you know, I am invited to contribute. Um, there's really a palpable shift. Um, and, and in my mind, right, um, I'm hearing where bias or their egos are getting in the way. And I have to have the courage to uh, contribute an alternative um, that they will be willing to absorb, even if they are being very ego driven in that meeting and certainly women are just as ego driven as men can be but remember I'm almost always the only woman in the room um, and finally at the end I've usually proven myself often impress them and then they shake my hand on the way out and the fact is this scenario has played out again and again all across the United States although it's particularly um, it's, it happens more often in the south and the midwest um, I've worked all over the place uh, with various partners, uh, but also all over the world. I've experienced this in every country I've worked in, uh, in one fashion or another. Um, and to this day, um, you know, while it's not ubiquitous, I'm over 40, I'm a senior executive, and many of the senior men still call me kiddo and invite me to walk into the elevator before they do. And so I, I will never understand that, but I've learned to just ignore it um, and, uh, and stop fighting it. Um, so we need courage because none of this is painless and yet you still gotta deliver every single day. So the next uh, sort of principle I wanna talk about is called play the room. And I don't mean that in like a, a sinister way at all, um, but really it's about um, knowing what you want and when to be the authority. Um, this authority isn't always uh, what you think it is. So, um, you know, recently, you know, mostly authority is bestowed to the most senior in the room and then the men. Um, but I have walked into rooms and it is never assumed that the woman among them uh, is the most senior. And never mind every dinner I've ever had to pay for because I'm the most senior person and the waiter never brings the check to me, not once. It's never happened once. 
um, and uh, even if if it's you know all men and one woman and they've got lots to choose from regardless um, so I want to share a context about playing the room it's broader than playing the room it's really about situational awareness so the very first time I had direct reports um, I was 31 years old every person on my team was male and they were 10 to 20 years older than me um, the most senior person who reported to me uh, was hired a few months prior to I had taken on that role and they hired him to do the job that they gave me instead so you can imagine there was a lot of tension but that team and that situation proved to be the birthplace of my biggest leap of maturity in my career um, that group worked for me for almost three years and in the end when I got promoted and took a new job that one individual who you know really struggled with me he, he actually got all choked up and shared with me that he had learned more in those three years than he had in his entire 25 year career, um, which I took as a, you know, a compliment, but at the same time, he did the work and I enabled him to figure out how to do the work that needed to be done in order to get him um, to that point. Um, so situational awareness, see people, see their motives, see their fears, recognize their styles, understand their perceived authority. So we'll call my team member John. I realized that John really believed that his 25 years, what he had been hired to do, what he had accomplished in his career, made him the authority on a large part of what I was responsible for. And um, I, I tried not to kick against that early, but what I recognized is that he needed to come across as the authority in charge. So. Eventually, I carved out like a space for him that he could own and control um, and would not be in conflict. And then through conversations, I could influence what he did, but that was always one on one. This in no way undermined my authority for the entirety, um, but I acquiesced that and um, created in both of us a uh, working relationship and respect that would not have been possible if I wasn't able to see him for what he was or see how I needed to be in that room to drive the 17 people who were working for me, of which he was one, to get that project done. And I enlisted him to be my right hand and do as much as he could, as far as he could, across my responsibilities when I needed the help, um, when we all needed the help. Um, I was a woman in that role and all the others uh, were men, uh, but for two other women. And at that sort of working level, that wasn't really uh, problematic, uh, but it always created a little bit of rub. My partner in the technology sphere, um, we definitely struggled over the, the, the who was calling the shots, uh, but that was more appropriate at our peer level. Um, but somehow I had to figure out across those three years how to win the hearts and minds of John uh, as well as the 200 people who worked on the project. Um, and I was never going to do that if I broadcast my authority like overtly and singularly, singularly every single day. Um, and no one was confused about what my decision making uh, power was. It just didn't, I didn't need to lead with it ever. And, um, you know, there's a lot of leaders who kind of have that iron fist and they use it as they see fit. And um, I learned that that style wasn't gonna work. Um, and so that wasn't how I did it. I recognized, acknowledged and celebrated the contributions of everybody and tried to get the, boast, the, the best out of everyone who worked for me. The business impact of this, like this isn't just like a touchy feely feel good story. Um, what we accomplished on that was something that had never been done before in the company. It was that stretch assignment um, and I had to, uh, across incredible complexity, these 200 people, five vendors, half of which were working in India, half of which were in the US, different time zones. Um, we had to re-engineer the entire business from how we worked internally to how our partners worked externally to how we brought our products to market and all the technology that sat behind that. So that required intense collaboration. Um, and we did it. And we didn't spend any more money than we were allocated. And this is like over $100 million. It's not, you know, $2 million, $3 million. It's a massive scope and scale of this. Um, and it truly was about bringing the people together, leading from the front, 
being there for them for whatever they needed um, and finding a rhythm that we turned into a mechanism and a culture. We took that those kind of um, management mechanisms and what inter underpinned that culture and brought it to future projects. And I was teaching the organization across the board how to do this. It became the new standard way of working. And, and so that's not to pat myself on the back, it's to say resident leadership works. It absolutely, absolutely works. And I call that playing the room. Be there, situational awareness, understand what needs to be done. And every time you can get the best out of your people before you ever put yourself um, in front of them, meaning ahead of them. Um, without supporting them. Okay, so the next one uh, that I want to talk about is building trust. And I think this is one of those obvious ones too, right? Everyone's going to build trust. But I want to share a story with you that I think is just going to wow you, right? And this is an example of me not understanding the being my authentic self meant that when I'm asked to do something that doesn't work, I have the right to say no. Um, so I worked for a senior executive and he had a bunch of business leaders reporting to him who each managed a PL. At that time, I ran operations and IT. I was in sort of a subservient position, even though we all were peers. Um, and in my performance review, about four months after I took the job, my boss said to me that I needed to find a way to earn the trust of one of the business leaders who was struggling with me. I said, well, what would you suggest? And what he said still blows me away. Um, he says, well, you know, he kind of, you know, kind of gets drunk with people and they bond over alcohol and cigars. So, you know, just think about it, maybe find an app, an opportunity. So I, you know, wow, I had no idea what to do with that feedback. I basically just ignored it. I was irritated. I didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to me. And I was just going to let it go. Sure enough, a couple months later, there's an offsite meeting. This business leader says, Hey, we need to talk. So let's meet tomorrow after dinner. And I think, oh, this must be the moment. So I arrive and it's sunset and it's beautiful and what have you. And he's got a bottle of white wine. And um, yeah, we just get right to it. Um, we drink, we clear the air, we drink some more, we plan the future, we drink some more on and on this goes until the bottle's um, finished. And I felt like I passed, like I did it. Okay, this is the beginning. Um, I think men and women drink with colleagues to be social. Um, but I've seen it and experienced it as a hazing of sorts, which sort of reminds me of like a college fraternity. Um, in the end, we became good friends. Uh, he trusts me. We got a lot of great work together. So it was a means to an end. Um, but I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't feel like that should have been necessary as a building block for trust. And I still think that now. And it was a compromise, one that I learned a lot from. Um, I've been in a work setting with just women and were drinking and had never once been, drink, been pressured to drink or take even one more sip than what anybody wanted to. Um, but with male colleagues, me and other women have been asked to play drinking games or you know, someone brings you glass of wine after glass of wine at a table that you didn't even ask for. Um, and uh, you know, I think it should not be essential for sporting outings and drinking and cigars as a male dominant way of bonding uh, to be necessary for men and women to build trust. So that's a bit of a soapbox, but it happens all the time. And I believe we need systems and practices that are more inclusive across the board and obviously uh, crossing uh, not only gender lines, um, but lines of race and ethnicity and origin um, for how and when people come to work in our companies. Um, so I believe that um, understanding what basis of trust can be with an individual uh, based on who they are and what they think and what you have in common um, is something that we should endeavor to do and not uh, conform just because that's what's been presented in front of us. Um, okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about is sponsorship and advocates. And I think what I might say could be controversial. So we should talk about it in the, um, in the comments, uh, if anybody wants to, or if when we have Q&A. Um, so in my industry, it's statistically more likely uh, when you lead a business, you will have 
um, a male boss and male sponsors. I've almost exclusively had male bosses and male sponsors in my 18 years in insurance. Um, I've had two female bosses for two very brief periods of time, and they both had more aggressive leadership styles than most of the men that I ever worked for. Um, they were very insensitive to their teams. They were hard on me and the entire team, uh, and I managed to work for each of them for less than a year because um, I found it to be very difficult. Neither one of them ever became my sponsor, and in fact, uh, both advocated against a pending promotion that I was um, that I was up for. Right before the big project, I had to get promoted to get that, and and they kicked against it. Um, and uh, I struggled with it then, and struggle with it now to understand. Um, so there have been any number of um, women's kind of advocacy groups. Uh, resource groups that exist in uh, businesses. And a lot of them are intended to create sponsorship and dialogue around how women can be successful as leaders. Um, but I've been to a lot of these meetings and in my experience, the conversation often devolves to a lot of uh, man-hating. Um, and I'll never forget, there was one woman, very senior in the company, she was standing behind a podium and she said, how you dress as a woman is so critical to your success. For example, don't wear a red suit. Uh, don't ever wear red high heels. Never wear a mini skirt. Be careful your shirt's not cut too low. Button all your buttons up. And then she pops out from behind the um, podium and she's wearing a plaid pink mini skirt that was about six inches above her knees. Um, now, fortunately, she had the figure to pull that off, but all of us were just sort of baffled in that moment, like, wait a minute, don't wear it on your way up the ladder, but once you get there, fair game, like what, it, it was, it was uh, difficult. So I didn't find them to be terribly useful early in my career, and I would defect from the groups. So one time, the president of the company called me and three other women executives into a room and said, uh, I called you here today because none of you are in the women's group. Um, your roles are very high profile. You should join. And he, he said, um, you know, why? And we told him why not. We weren't in there. And he said, well, be drivers of change. Join the group and, and be drivers. And so we said, well, help us understand who joins the group and why. What are they looking for? And uh, HR had done some surveys and most of the members were at mid-career levels. And their number one reason for being there was to find female sponsors to help them get promoted, okay? Um, and uh, the other was about figuring out work-life balance. Um, so first of all, you can never sponsor someone you don't know. Like I can't meet a stranger and become her sponsor. I have to, he or she, um, see how they work, how they interact, what their goals are, what their development areas are, how they're progressing on those, what's their aptitude for learning, how committed are they to their career. All of those inputs are necessary for effective sponsorship so that I can actually advocate for them in a way that puts my name on the line with theirs. And I believe that they're going to do uh, what's required of them in the next position. Um, so they didn't quite understand that like strangers can't advocate for strangers. Um, but the other point around work-life balance, um, this is one that I get asked a lot and nobody likes the answer to this question. Um, th the answer is, if you want to succeed in this male-dominated environment where all the measures of success and your contribution are based on what the men themselves did, you have to actually work like a man. I didn't say act like a man or behave like a man but you have to work like a man. And I don't say that to be sexist or controversial. Traditionally, men have a wife or a partner at home who has a much less demanding career um, and they're able to work long hours. You have to do the time in some industries. Me and all the other women who succeeded to the point that we have, we all did the time. We all had a stay at home husband. Um, and, and maybe others haven't, but in the environment that we existed in. And so, um, you know, men are not typically at the very senior levels uh, walking out the door at three o'clock to go to a 
baseball game or leaving in the middle of the day for a parent teacher conference, uh, take their kids to doctor's appointments. It doesn't, it didn't happen. The men who are in power now uh, as they were ascending through their career. So that level of sensitivity to working moms being able to do that um, can be limiting. And I think um, it may contribute to why I still am where I am, which is fine. I accept that. Um, but the women who asked me about this, they've left almost in tears because they know their husbands won't help them. And that's an issue unto itself. So these resource groups, their, their primary function is around, um, you know, giving women sponsorship. And as I've been asked, they want me to tell them that you get to be who and exactly how you are. You can leave every single day when you need to for your kids. Uh, no one will notice. You will do just perfectly fine. If everyone working next to them um, is working differently, right? That is the reality, at least in our industry, in financial services, et cetera. Um, so he asked us to join anyway. Um, and we did, but we didn't actually, um, we didn't actually uh, participate too much. Um, and then I went to work for another company. Um, so today, I, um, I, I can give as much as my children need. And when I was at the ascent uh, leading up to where I am now, I had about five to 10% of my total capacity, um, like dedicated to being there for them. Um, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't want it. Um, it was where I found myself in that moment. And being a sole provider, you need to, I felt I needed to guarantee um, that my earnings would continue to increase to provide, uh, you know, equivalent to what two working adults uh, would provide. Um, and so I didn't emulate what the men did. I just observed around me, how late did my boss stay at the office? How late did the leader next to me stay in the office? And it just created um, a lot of, uh, a lot of challenge on the personal side. So um, now I have that balance and um, I think, you know, for me, um, I haven't given as much as I could to uh, helping women advance. Um, Hannah and um, Belinda said wonderful things. I certainly do uh, mentor, but I haven't contributed in a way uh, beyond the individual level um, to help make structural improvements, to help drive insight about issues. Um, when I left one company and my exit interview, the majority of the reasons why I was leaving that company was because I wasn't respected as a new mother and uh, given the time I needed uh, at all to be with my son and they were unkind about it. And I shared all of that in my exit interview. Um, I don't know that it ever went anywhere. Um, there happened to have been four extremely senior executives who all left at the exact same time and they were very worried about that and wanted to understand what could be done about it. Um, but I haven't, I haven't offered my time and my efforts to ever try to really improve the condition of women, of women in the workplace uh, beyond, um, beyond individuals that I work with. And that's mostly because I've been focused on my career and stealing every minute I could um, to be there uh, with my kids. So I will wrap up now and just, um, just share a, kind of a couple of thoughts. Um, in our lives, like we make uh, a lot of choices um, in our journey. I think rising to the top um, against all odds, um, you know, contributing as I did, working as hard as I did, uh, constantly questioning and doubting and seeking validation that I was doing good work um, because I was often getting such uh, dissenting feedback um, for many reasons. Um, that has been uh, my experience. Um, I have had very positive impact on many people who have worked for me. I've mentored and coached countless individuals. Some have even dubbed it the Casey Kempton University, which still makes me blush. Um, but I think those who have worked with me uh, take something forward with them. And if the, that is the only thing I ever accomplish in my career, um, I will be very satisfied with that. And if I can have that impact, not just for the people who work for me, um, the people I work with, the people I report to, 
And if I can, you know, live in my utopian, we're all in this to make each other better. And when we do, that drives better business results. Uh, even if others aren't thinking that way, um, I do make that my number one priority. At the end of the day, there are many inequalities, um, color, origin, gender, um, everybody struggles. Um, I, I don't want this to come across like, you know, woe is me. Um, it, it, there are many worse struggles than what I have gone through. There are much more severe obstacles that people face. Um, these are some of the things that I've experienced and some of the ways that I've um, tried to uh, live into being my authentic self, identifying ways to build trust, um, acting as a resonant leader, um, and ultimately trying to lean into what I think is a responsibility um, to address now some of the broader pathologies in our corporate cultures. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much. That was so awesome, Casey. Um, so everyone, we have now a Q&A um, for however long we need it. So uh, we have one question that came in. Um, what technical skills do you think that women should look to achieve as they progress in their career? What do we mean by technical skills? I think you mentioned like, um, like operations and like process minded or orientedness. Yeah. Um, like, I think that could be considered a technical skill learning about that. Like how, where do you focus or, or where should we be looking to kind of accumulate uh, technical skills versus like, um, you know, being authentic and courageous, that kind of skill. I actually see the technical skills as secondary to the leadership skills and the personal development. So you could have the best, and this is, this is a challenge in business, okay? So let's pick on an actuary. So you go to school or actuarial science, you come out, you're an actuary. They happen to make a ton of money when they come out of college, good for them, right? Because they passed all these exams and what have you. Um, and then eventually they become managers and leaders of that tower, right? But just because they had all those technical skills and were a phenomenal individual contributor does not mean they will be a good manager um, because managing people, which is different than leadership, uh, isn't something you just like are born into, right? I mean, you, you, have to, you have to listen, you have to ask questions, you have to be supportive, you have to make sure people show up on time if it's that type of a workforce, right? You have to be willing to put performance plans in place if that's what's necessary. All the while you have to motivate and encourage them. And then when you get to leadership, well, now you're setting a vision. And vision is usually about change or is about progress, right? Like vision isn't like, we're gonna be exactly what we are forever, woohoo, right? It's about, we need to do this better, this faster, this cheaper, get to our customers this way. All of that is gonna drive a difference. So that requires broad business management skills, right? It doesn't matter what good of an actuary you are, you may not ever be a good leader or a good manager. So I guess if you think of broad business as a technical skill versus a soft skill, um, that would be something. So for example, I told you I studied cognitive anthropology. I therefore never took a business class because why would I do that? I was also an English major, right? I could read wonderful novels and learn about people all over the world. There was no way I was taking a business class. In fact, I was going to join the Peace Corps. So I was like anti-business. Um, but uh, I started working in marketing for a corporation and I went to community college at night just to take foundational business courses and marketing courses because I had no frame of reference for this context I was in, right? They told me to go do this research and write these papers, compare and contrast these companies. Sure, I could do that. That's what I've been doing, right? For the last five years, um, but to do what, right? And so I went and got that context on my own um, and then just constantly was filling up that tank with everything I learned. I'm like, oh, that's how this works. And that's how this works and putting the puzzle together to create that total picture. So whatever it is that an individual needs to do to put the broader context, like in their, their sphere of vision, like you need to have that, I think, um, more than any one skill, but I still put the people skills as number one. <laughs> no, that's, Awesome. And I think like it's refreshing to hear that, um, you know, that the technical skills are secondary. 
Um, okay, does anyone have any questions or comments? Margaret, I like that you regularly break the red rules. I don't regularly break them, but my first blazer I bought was bright red. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment, um, and I'm just glad to hear someone else say it. Casey, thank you so much for this. Um, I feel like everyone, all, all professional women need to hear this. But I remember when I first went out and started my business, I went to Kohl's because that was the extent of what I could afford at the time. And I was grateful for that. And I, would, I bought a black blazer and matching skirt and a gray blazer and matching skirt. And that's what I wore to networking events. And I just felt like, okay, well, I'm in the dress code. But it was just so, once I came into my own, maybe even a few years later, I started lap, you know, being a little more loose and being who I was. Um, it was so freeing. And now you'll see me, you know, wearing glitter blazers. <laughs> and, um, you know, whatever floats my boat for the day. But I just, I think that's just something that's so important because we feel like we have to show up a certain way and um, to fit in. And sometimes we do. And I've been told that like playing the room, playing the people um, at their level. And then actually once you get to a certain level, being able to be who you are. And it's like, well, why not do a little of that before you actually get there, right? So thank you. Yeah, it certainly would have been a lot less stressful. Uh, the the adage that pick out your clothes the night before or wear the exact same thing to work every day so you don't use any morning brain power on determining an outfit. <laughs> Exhausted by the train because I had to choose between raspberry or boys or like whatever. Um, yeah. I've envied the fact that a man can show up in a blue shirt and gray pants every single day with mm -hmm. shoes, depending on what they prefer, uh, travel with one blazer and wear it three days in a row. Um, and I've questioned like, why can't I do that? Like if I wanted to do that, I suppose I could, but not feeling like it's okay or it's expected, right? We have more variety. We're expected to be somewhat fashionable, but fashionable, but not edgy. Mm -hmm. There's right. And then, you know, which client are you meeting with and how do they dress? And, you know, and I would love permission to never have to put any more thought into it than what am I going to be comfortable in and what is going to make me. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I have another, another scenario that just came to mind. How about the fact, I don't know if this has ever crossed your mind or anyone else's, but there's an outfit that I wanted to wear because I just, that was what I had in mind. But then I thought, oh no, and I forgive me if this is too inappropriate, is this too sexy? Will I be sending the wrong message? <laughs> yeah. And then so it's like, ah, better go back to the gray blazer. <laughs> so we had a group of, uh, I'll just say this one thing, I'm so sorry. We had a group of interns come in and it was a Friday night and they must have all been going out on the town that night because they showed up in mini dresses that were low cut with like seven inch heels that had sequins and sparkles all over them and nothing else. And one of my male colleagues, now on this particular um, team, remarkably, there were six women and one man. Um, he comes in late and he is flustered and flabbergasted and we're like, oh my goodness, are you okay? What happened? And he's like, I don't, I don't know what happened in the hallway, but uh, we need to call HR right now. And, and these women have created like this massive sort of stir. And we had to tell them, um, HR had to tell them like, that is perfectly appropriate for the club, um, but we wouldn't wear that to work. And that wasn't the only offense. It was low cut, it was too tight, it was too high heels. Um, and it was, it was a really difficult, experience for the women who were managers who had to relay these messages to say you have to button that button why uh because that's just what we do <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. it will be inappropriate uh but i like it that way uh, that when you go to lunch outside the office go ahead and button it uh but not in the meeting right it's a very i think that's always a very difficult topic well i just want to point out 
as everybody probably has noticed, that you're really quite a beautiful woman. I, it's hard for me to believe that you haven't had the, some inappropriate behavior come your way during this climb to the top. You don't have to name names or do anything, but it's like the whole thing we're talking about right now is just the tip of the iceberg. And not everybody, I, I mean, I wonder about the men drinking with women and plying them with more wine. Do they think they're gonna fall off their managerial pedestal and suddenly reveal themselves as you know, something else? I mean, I don't yeah. really know. I've been very fortunate. I've only had that happen once, um, wow. but I'm very good when I get asked for a nightcap, like just the two of us to be like, mm, uh, thank you, I'm going to bed. Um, and, you know, didn't come across like a proposition, just an invite, but I wasn't even going to go there. And so there was one time where it was just pushed a little too hard. And um, that was like another thing I put on the pile for ultimately leaving that company. That same person, when I quit, I told him, he said, gee, that's really unfortunate because you're one of the few women, if not the only, that we're not actually having to force up the line. You're earning it. Jeez. She's like, it just makes you want to put some, push somebody down an elevator shaft. You know. uh, yeah, but you have to be, you just have to be smart about how, where you put yourself. And, and in my case, even, you know, how I, how I present myself, I'm, I'm always very careful about that. Yeah, I 100% agree. So Casey, I'd love to know, I mean, you spoke a little bit earlier about women um, when, when you were, you know, being asked to support other women and how there are times when you're really for it. And then there are times when you feel like you're being pushed into a corner. It's like, you're the woman that has to support the other women and you, you know, you've just got to do it. How do you make that call? What is it within you that says, okay, you're the person that I really want to mentor and, you know, and, and what is it, you know, how does it work with that level of making a decision and how much you give? That's a great question. Um, and I've been faced with lots of opportunities to mentor and some I've chosen not to for sure, or it's been expected that I would, but in the end, um, I couldn't. And so advocacy and mentorship, right, are not the, not the same thing. And so advocacy is something we mostly end up doing for the people who work directly for us that we know so much about them. Um, or work in, in an adjacent. Um, the number one characteristic that I look for is something that approximates a lifetime learner. Someone who really, truly wants to dig in and do the hard work. Um, and, you know, nothing is more frustrating for me than someone bringing me a problem and saying, how do you think I might approach this problem? And I'll say, well, you have three options. Um, this is what you could do. These are the likely outcomes. Uh, let's talk through which of those you think is the right fit. Um, and then, you know, two months later, they're like, uh, it's still broken. Did you do anything about it? Wait, what did we talk about? Um, so that's done, right? I have no time for you anymore. I'm sorry, but I just don't, right? I might give them another chance. Um, and then, you know, sometimes the people who work for you, they have an expectation that if they worked hard, they're the most valuable employee and they should get the highest ranking and the biggest bonus, right? And that's always an exceptionally hard conversation. So I make it a point, even with people who I wouldn't mentor, but who work for me, to try to offer continuous feedback so that nobody's surprised at the end of the year. Um, but if someone presents me a problem, I will say, do you want me to offer you something on this? Um, I try not to give solicited advice. Sometimes I can't help myself. Um, but at the end of the day, you can't help people who won't help themselves. It's an adage, it's true. And I don't have time to waste on anybody who's not interested. And sometimes it might take three or four meetings before I even realize that's the case in a pure mentorship role where they sort of like pick my name out of a hat and they're like, you're successful. Let me come and meet with you every other month. Right. And I say, well, make a proposal to me on what it is we're going to work on and how am I going to understand how you're really performing on that? And that scares a lot of people away because they don't want to do the work, right? They just want someone to sit there and give them all the answers. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting. Because I, I you know, for in, in my position as well, I get people that are, you know, wanting the support. And and for me, it's also, there's also a level of, of like that connection that you have with somebody. 
Um, and if that connection is a strong connection, then there's that level of it's like, okay, this is, this is a much, it's a much easier uh, conversation. It's a much easier help. It's a much easier, but when sometimes there's a little bit of like a, a rub, you know, in, in the relationship, it's like, okay, so how can I, how can I also in a way put my own stuff to one side and step up above, above that and still offer that support? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I face that too. It's hard. Um, but sometimes you have to, um, you have to do that for sure. Um, so I think that's all we had, unless anyone has any final comment. Well, thank you so much, um, Casey. Thank you so much, Chubb. Uh, we recorded this, so uh, we will make it available um, afterwards. And uh, please drop in the chat uh, your contact info if you'd like to connect or if you'd like us to follow up with you on anything. Um, and Casey, thank you. Thank you so much. That was so awesome. Yeah, I would, I would, uh, I love hearing from you all. Thank you for your questions. I thank you for uh, listening. I don't know that um, anybody learned very much new, but I do think there's texture around these things and hopefully that useful for you all. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Casey. I certainly did. And I have like three, what I think are pretty fun quotes that I have to figure out how to use somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your Tuesday. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.